Presume Denison was a, a really interesting writing uh, uh, problem because um, I was first employed to, uh, to write it for Sidney Pollack, uh, who was also producing it. And I said to Sidney after I had read the book, I said, you know, there are about 18 different movies that you could make out of this book. Um, are we going to sit down and work out, you know, what, what you want to do? And he said, you know something, I don't want to do that. He said, if we sit here and we work out, you know, a one-line, you know, the, uh, a, a sequential uh, version of the story as what we're going to do, and then you go away and write it. He said, you know, things are going to change. My attitude's going to change, and I'm going to forget things. You're going to find things don't work, and so you're going to have to invent something that does work. And when you bring it back, he said, I'm going to be reading it and playing it back in my mind against the version that we talked about here in the office. And I'm, all of a sudden, I'm distracted because I expected to see something happen on page 15 that we talked about, and it's not there. And it just takes my mind right out of what I'm reading on the paper. So I would rather have your absolute fresh take on it. Let's not talk. And I said, OK, that's fine. I love that. But um, at the same time, um, there are a lot of different movies here. And I said, do this for me. Just do, um, just do free association. Tell me the first couple of words that come into your head when you think of this book because that will give me a clue as to where to go with it. So he thought for a second, and he said, sex and blood. So I went back to the book, and I thought, sex and blood. So I wrote a version of him that, for example, began with um, sort of mysterious shadows in a dark room, and the curtains are blowing, and you're not quite sure exactly what you can see and what you can't see, except that you gradually realize that a man and a woman are making love on a bed. And, and the cries of lust in one thing and another get louder and louder and louder and so on until there is a scream that is almost like a death rattle that you think is an orgasm, but then the scene turns into mourning and you see that there is the body of a woman there and there are police standing around her and they're taking samples of her pubic hair and they're, uh, they're, it's a, a crime scene and so on. And then in comes a man, Rusty, who might or might not be the man that we saw in the early part of that, of that surreal kind of, of scene and so on. And we move on from there. Um, so that was the beginning of, of the telling the story when it's about sex and blood. Um, and so on with the rest of it. Then uh, what happened was um, they were made, he, uh, Cindy was producing a picture called The Rain Man. And uh, they had lost a director on it. Um, so he went off to, uh, to replace the director himself. He took over Rain Man. And um, I remember him saying to him, why, you know, you said after Tootsie you were never going to work with Dustin Hoffman again. Why are you doing, doing this? And he said, oh, I talked to Dustin, and Dustin says he's changed. <laughs> so. At any rate, um, he went off to, uh, to direct uh, Rain Man and then subsequently um, decided that he didn't want to work with Dustin anymore. So he quit the picture and brought in um, uh, who finally directed it, you know. Uh, doesn't matter because that's not part of this story. But the point is, he now removed himself from it. But he was allowed to leave the picture on condition that from Warner Brothers. That, um, that he replace himself as director with someone of equal, equal stature. So um, he, um, he asked Alan Pakula to come in and take over. They sent my script that I had started writing for, for Sydney to Alan. Alan read the script and called me up and said, this is terrific. I'm going to do the picture and one thing or another. When can we get together? And I said, OK, great. I'll, I'll be there. In, whenever you're ready. So it took about 10 days before we could put together a meeting. And by the time I got there, he'd read the book, which he had not read before. And he said, listen, I love your script. But he said, that's not what the, I love the book. He said, well, I want to do the book. And this is not the book. And I said, no, this is the book told uh, from the point of view it, through sex and blood. This is a sex and blood version of the book and so on. And I said, what do you want to do? And he said, well, to me, it's not sex and blood. Um, and I said, well, just give me you know, free association in a few words, just what uh, comes to mind when you think of it. And, and he said, 
um, law and order and belief, which is what the book is about on another level because it's about Rusty Savitz who is a district attorney who truly believes in the order in the universe which includes the order and, and stability of a legal uh, system which presumes innocence um, and which he truly believes that he at least and nobody has ever sent an innocent man to jail. And what happens then in the story is he discovers that in fact circumstances conspire to almost send him to not to the, even to jail but to the uh, electric chair. And so um, I said, well, you know, this is a very peculiar thing because I've already written the screenplay. Um, and what we're doing here is not exactly changing the, we're not changing the story or the characters, but I don't know whether I can shift gears. I really don't know whether I can or not. Um, and he said, well, I wish you would, so think about it. And I did for, um, for several days. And I finally decided that the only way to approach it was to completely throw away the version I had done for Sidney Pollack and not even read it or think about it again, but to start all over again from the book, but with the idea now that what we are talking about is order in the universe, about the stability of, of life, and, our, and the obligation that we have in life as our own jurors of, of our life and bringing in a verdict of what our lives are about requires us to make difficult choices because the truth is ambiguous and we can't always know whether people are lying or whether we're getting the right version of it and so on, but still we have to judge. So the beginning of the version for Pecula starts with um, an empty courtroom with Rusty Savage's Harrison Ford's voiceover simply saying all those things about our obligation as the, uh, uh, to our society and to ourselves because there may come a time when we are going to be judged and we are going to have to, to, um, to exercise our best efforts to, to make these decisions. And they're going to be unpleasant and we're not going to wait, ma want to make the decision, but we're going to have to. And that becomes the opening of the scene for Pakula. And it's a completely different movie. You know, it's the same story, same characters and everything, but it's so different. Um, once I was able to completely forget what I had done for, uh, for Sydney, um, it was... I won't say it was easy, because it's a very rich book and it was tough to, uh, to, to make it work, um, but uh, uh, at least it was possible. And it was, in that sense, was the most interesting thing to, to, to arbitrarily completely change everything, try to s turn your mind around. Well, I've been writing uh, steadily, I mean, it just happens that the movies have not been being produced. Um, for various reasons, some um, uh, some are tied up with uh, with so much money written off against them that uh, nobody will do it. One of them, believe it or not, is considered too violent um, by the one person who ought to do it. Um, I'm the person who turned down the first Rambo because I, uh, the violence in it disgusted me. So here I, <laughs> but in the context of this other story, I found it was justified to to really murder somebody in a horrible way. But um, um, so I've never stopped writing, but um, directing uh, is something that I, I'm equally fond of, of, of doing. Um, I don't know that one is, well, writing from scratch, if you don't have much to begin with, it, especially if you're doing an original, um, or doing very thin material, uh, is... Uh, is in a sense more difficult because you, you don't have that story to begin with. And, and getting through that early conceptualization is the single most difficult part of the whole thing. Um, so, but uh, you know, as a director, when you come in and you start working with the writer and so on, you, you, you're, you already have the material, you already have uh, the writer who him or herself um, has a conception that, um, you know, you, you, you have allies. Um, directing is a far more social experience, too. It's a matter of manipulating people and getting people to do things, um, especially the actors, which they may or may not agree with or want to do, uh, which is a co completely different thing. It's a political and social process as opposed to an intellectual and emotional process. I don't mean that the directing is not emotional as well, but 
that is the essential difference between the two. Um, and I think that the first is, is more difficult because you don't have, you don't have that beginning place to, uh, to jump off. Um, but I, um, I'd like to say something else too, and that is in writing things, there are some things that I write that, um, that I see with such clarity and, and specificity that I really want to direct those myself because I know exactly what I want to do, how it should look and, and what, the, what it should feel like and what the emotions should be at any given moment. Um, there are other things that I write that I'm looking at and I'm saying, gee, I'd love to see what Sidney Pollack would do with this or I'd love to see what so-and-so would do with this because I'm curious about what they would do with it. It'd be fun. And um, uh, so those I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, um, uh, to release, relinquish into somebody else's um, care or, or to try it myself. But I think that it's probably a mistake to direct something unless you really feel you s really feel it deeply and, and see it, see it with, with that kind of clarity, uh, diamond clear p clarity. Because directing is damn difficult. Um, whether it's easier or not than, than writing is a different issue. It's still a damn difficult thing to do. You've got so many judgments and decisions you have to make, and any one of them can sink your, um, your picture dead in the water. Um, you know, there are so, so many more ways to go wrong than there are ways to go right in making a movie, you know, a, a little bit of casting. Um, one of the difficulties, major difficulties for directors in, in making films, especially today, when the lead actors and actresses cost so much money that by the time you've got them in the film, there's relatively little money left for all the other parts that surround them. So what you tend to do is you've got, you've got, um, uh, You've got one terrific actor who is exactly right for the part, and then you have wind up surrounding him with a level of actors who are just not, not providing that kind of support. Um, you know, it's Jesus Christ and Tom, Dick, and Harry. And it's um, uh, an awful lot of films sink on the casting of the secondary parts, simply because there isn't the money to hire the, 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 the people of, of the level of talent that you really need. Um, so there are all those decisions, and um, and then there, of course, is the constant wear and tear on the, uh, the feet and and uh, and legs. Um, but um, I often say that in teaching, we're, we're uh, trying to line up faculty for AFI. We're looking for directors whose whose knees have failed and and writers whose minds have gone. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, uh, so the difference between, and as an experience, just as an experience in life, directing is a lot more, um, uh, you know, is, is, is m much more deeply satisfying because it lasts over a long period of time, because it is a social experience, because if you've made your decisions about who you surround yourself with and who you're working for, um, that can be a constant source of satisfaction on a daily basis. Whereas with writing, um, the, the satisfactions tend to be short. Um, you know, the day that the screenplay gets read by somebody who comes back and says, this is terrific, we'll green light it. And the day that you see it in the theater, and it has been serviced well by a good director and a great cast and so on. And then that's it. The rest of the time, it's really hard, it's just damn hard work. One of the problems that directors, many directors and producers have and executives with writers is they try to do the writer's work, you know. They'll just arbitrarily change things and um, or order things to be done and so on. You have to, as a director, working with a writer, unless, you know, Loring and I very often, we think very alike about things. And it's very satisfying from that, from that standpoint and much easier to work with with somebody like that or with Alvin. Um, but when you've got, what do you do when the writer disagrees with you, just thinks that this is a bad idea? Uh, you can't make them write it. Um, and sometimes what you have to do is just put your head down and say, listen, I'm sorry, I can't direct it the way it is because I just don't believe it as a moment. At that point, what is really required um, is a, almost a social skill uh, in the way that you work with an actor who perhaps doesn't get or understand or can't feel what it is that you're trying to get out of the part and so on. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, part of it, 
part of it is to be persuasive, part of it is to, um, to seduce, part of it is to, in some fashion or other, uh, inspire. But I think inspiration is the biggest part of it. And I don't know how, because every problem is different, every writer is different, every situation is different. Loring and I um, um, have reached a point in our mutual collaborations so that um, he sends me uh, um, a draft um, and I go through it and I may either make notes, uh, mostly I make notes and so on, but here and there, by way of illustration, I'll say, um, what if the speech goes this way? And I insert the speech, don't replace his, but I insert it, you know, with a computer, you can just put it in in such a way, different color, print out or something like that, so that he can take a look at it and then he, he'll take that and either say, oh no, that's a piece of shit and that's the wrong decision to make, and I'll respect that line. Or um, he'll say, yeah, th I see what you mean. And then he'll take it and rewrite it in his voice. And, um, um, and that works very well. But every, every writer is different. David McCullough's uh, uh, book about Harry Truman was bought by uh, 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 Paula Weinstein uh, and uh, sold to HBO. And uh, uh, she hired uh, Tom Rickman. They wanted me to write it, I couldn't. And in fact, I didn't want to. I, 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 um, and th so they hired Tom Rickman, and Tom and I worked together on it for quite a long time. It was very difficult because of the nature of the material. It was very episodic and very, you know, this, the, 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 you're going through so much of a man's life of this, the, here's this vignette, and here's this vignette, and this vignette, and how, how does it all add up? How do you tie them all together? So our major problem there were, were two. One is that Paula and I, and to a lesser extent um, uh, Tom, um, started out to do a hatchet job on, on uh, Truman because we both blamed him at that point um, for the, uh, the loyalty oath which led to the blacklisting. And it was a huge mistake on Truman's part and he never disavowed it. But the issue of loyalty was a, an absolute passion of his. And that's where the loyalty oath stemmed from. He thought he was doing a good thing, and he thought he was going to head off what McCarthy was doing and, the, uh, and HUAC. It didn't work out that way. Um, at any rate, once we got into it, the more we learned about Harry Truman, the more we began to, to um, we just came around 180 degrees. Um, so that it, it almost is a, um, um, a hagiography, you know, making him the hero. And then when I look at it, I think, wait a second, you know, he must have had some bad things too. <coughs> but um, so it, to a certain extent, it, it was a, uh, a political motivation that led us into it uh, that we abandoned once we got into it and just tried to do a portrait of, of a very interesting man in di surviving difficult situations. Um, but the major problem was finding a style for it to try and tie it together. And so it was a, ma it was a matter of finding the bottle for the, uh, for the, uh, for the story. Um, we, at one point, we, we, uh, in one draft, we had it all built around, uh, um, well, to a certain extent, it still is that way, come to, come to think of it, but using the railroad as a theme all the way through it and to tie it together. Um, but we, we went through an enormous amount of difficulty trying to find a style for it. That was the hardest thing for it um, on that particular project. Um, Tom finished the, the, uh, the, the draft, which we were almost ready to shoot, when he had to go off and do another uh, movie project that he was committed to. So one of the major difficulties was that I didn't have him available to me when I was actually on location and shooting because the act every actor would be coming in with research material because it was a historical, you know, uh, uh, document that we were doing. It was about history. There was an enormous amount of history available to them on the characters that they were going to play. So they would show up with a sheaf of magazine articles, excerpts from books, and one thing and another, and say, "Well, this is this is what my character did in life, and don't you think this is more interesting than what you have, you know, um, written here?" And in some cases, it was. And I didn't have Tom available to me to, to do those things, so I wound up having to do them in my hotel room on weekends and, and nights um, myself. And I would send the pages to him, um, you know, hoping that he would 
like it or reply, you know, be able to um, to polish it up before I would shoot it. Although in many cases it was something that was, you know, it was already shot by the time he had a chance to read it. So that aspect of it, I think, was kind of unpleasant for 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 Tom, and um, and it caused some difficulty. We're cl very close personal friends, but I think that it uh, for a while it really colored our relationship. Um, and it's another reason why, you know, that sometimes it's better not to work with friends because these things are necessary. You have to do them. You're suddenly sta you're standing on the stage and the actor can't do the scene the way it's written. You've but got to rewrite it. That's an argument for having the writer on the set. Oh, it's a wonderful argument for writing. Absolutely. No question about it. You've got enough to do as a director to, uh, not to have to do the rewrites that are necessary um, because it rained and um, you had to move the, the scene inside or something like that, you know. Um, on this picture that we uh, just finished, that uh, uh, ran in May on HBO, called Conspiracy, and Laurie Mandel uh, was on the set for two and a half weeks of rehearsal, and also the first ten days of shooting. And it was absolutely, like, um, you know, it was a blessing. Because if you had the situation I was mentioning earli earlier, an actor is standing there and saying, you know something, I can't read these lines. It just doesn't work for me. I'm sorry, it's not my fault. And, you know, a lot of writers get really upset with that and say, you know, bullshit, read it the way it is. But you can't do that. I mean, no less than George Bernard Shaw um, said in one of his prefaces and so on, that if you've got an actor that can't say the line, you have, one, uh, you have two choices. One is to fire the actor and replace him, which nine times out of ten you cannot do. And the other is to change the line, because otherwise you're just going to have a flat reading. And it, just accept it. That's part of the collaborative art of, of, of drama. And uh, so, you know, uh, Stanley Tucci um, had a long monologue to do, and, um, and he was finding it difficult to, the rhythms of it, he was finding difficult. So he came over to me and he said, um, you know, what if um, I did this this way? And I said, listen, before you say that, why don't you go off with Loring and the two of you see what you work out. And he said, oh, I can do that? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So he went and, uh, and Loring sat down. And after about half an hour, they came back like um, you know, smiling like little kids who were bringing me a present and so on and said, what do you think of this? Well, it was terrific. And Loring was happy and Stanley was happy. And I'm happy because it was better. And it was better than Loring had done on, on his own. And it was sure as hell was better than Stanley would have done on his own, although Stanley is a very accomplished director and writer himself. But um, um, no, that's, that's uh, of course, Loring um, has the advantage of having grown up in the, in the um, uh, gotten his start in the theater and in live television and uh, working under those conditions and so on. I think an awful lot of, of the um, younger writers now tend to have a much more arbitrary feeling about it, you know, just read it the way it is and so on. And they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. Just briefly talk about Citizen Cone and how that came about um, before we get into the craft questions. Because okay. that was something I, f I found that pretty interesting. Well, um, um, a, uh, a producer named Linda Gottlieb uh, had brought that picture to me, oh God, a good 10 years before uh, we actually made it at HBO, which is already five years ago. Um, and it was long before Angels in America. It was a script that, um, that was kind of musical in its rhythms. It was simply wonderful. And it was, uh, as it were, the point of view of a man um, who is dying of AIDS um, and is hallucinating about his experiences and about what he had been through in his, in his life. Um, and of course, he's a terrible man. He's one of the worst uh, villains that, you know ever lived. He's a homosexual, persecuted homosexuals, and a Jew, a Jew who was anti-Semitic. Um, and he destroyed every life that he touched. So, you know, this is one time when HBO's selling line, you know, log line, and so on was accurate. He, he destroyed uh, every life he touched, including his own. And at any rate, it was absolutely fascinating. And. Uh, uh, and she offered it to me to direct as a movie. And I said, Linda, you're never going to get this made as a movie. I just don't believe anybody will ever do it. Or they're gonna, there, there are so many changes that are going to be forced on it, it's just going to be you know, impossible. So she went away and she spent years trying to get it done as a movie before she was uh, able to sell it at HBO. 
And um, Bob Cooper called me and asked me if I wanted to direct it, uh, directed something for him, and he sent the script over, and I was astounded. You know, it was the same story, but now developed into a, uh, in a more television-ish kind of way. Um, but I thought it was absolutely magical the way it could, the, the, the style, again, it was a matter of finding the right style for, for the content. And that's the single most important thing um, about writing, getting started and so on, is to find, to find the style of it, to find the feeling of it um, before you actually get into the specifics of, you know, the actual, you know, the structural elements and trying to, to, to make it work. Um, and I spent a lot of time do doing that. I guess we're naturally working into the issue of, of, um, of craft here. But um, that was enormously interesting to, uh, to direct because so much was happening with, with, uh, with Jimmy Woods that was spontaneous uh, on, the, uh, on the set. Uh, every day when we walked on, I had no idea what the end of the day was going to be like, and I love it like that. I, I work very um, improvisationally with a plan, if you know what I mean. Um, I have a concept, and as a director, uh, when I come on, of what the, what, how the, the scene is going to feel. Uh, and and I, I can't describe it. It's not something that I can put into words. Um, but then you begin to move people around in, in the scene, and, to, to, and it begins to take on its own life. And, um, and, and DPs sometimes get very upset with me because I only have maybe one or two shots on my shot list, and I know I'm going to make some others, but I don't know what they're going to be yet until I see what is actually happening. So um, did you work yeah. closely with the writer on that at all? David, David no. Franzoni, no. David was off doing a picture for, um, uh, for um, Stone, Oliver Stone. So again, it was a qu question. He was not available. Uh, when we got into the final strokes of, of, um, of doing what was necessary to rewrite it. The major thing uh, that, w that happened there was um, it was not just the usual thing if you find a location and you have to re you know, do some rewrite and tinkering and so on to make. The major thing was that David's a young guy. He, he had not lived through that period. Loring Mandel had. So for example, there's a part of, her, of Walter Winchell in there. Um, David just didn't have, he didn't know, uh, we couldn't even find tapes, oddly enough, of Walter Winchell to play for him. Um, but Loring had grown up listening to, uh, to Walter Winchell, so it was easy for him to write those things and so on. And, and um, the style of the times, the way in which people talked and so on, not accessible to David because he had not lived through it and it was not part of his experience. It was part of Loring's, which is one reason why he, he um, he did an extraordinary job, an uncredited uh, rewrite, and uh, he should have gotten the credit, in my opinion. I sit down to write every morning at uh, 10 o'clock, and I stay in front of my computer and try to avoid answering the, t uh, the telephone um, and, uh, until 12. And I set aside those two hours every day, no matter what, um, Sundays, holidays, and everything. And I've been doing it for so many years that now I am truly addicted to it, um, in the sense that one is addicted to a drug. And if I don't do it, I get very testy, I get angry, and I get it with myself. Um, so that my wife and my kids and my dogs, you know, just beg me to, for God's sake, go and write for a little bit, because otherwise we can't stand you. Um, and I never, I try never to write nothing. I, I don't, I don't want to sit there and just look out the window endlessly and so on. I'll, if I can't. If I can't, there's something wrong with the theme and, and, and it isn't working, then there's something missing. Either I don't know what a character wants in the scene or there's no conflict um, in the scene. And, you know, those are very specific things. And um, so you, you learn very quickly that if it doesn't write itself or you can't find your way to write it, that it's, um, it's because you don't understand the scene very well. You don't understand what one of the characters is doing, and so on. So a lot of it is just sort of sitting down and, and, uh, and all kind of literally writing that question to myself, what does so-and-so want um, in this scene? Uh, what is he trying to do? Um, why did he come into this room? Why does he stay in this room at all? You know, and in answering those questions, you, you sort of grope your way 
to finding out uh, enough about the character so that you can begin to write a scene. Sometimes I just do dumb exercises, like if I don't, I feel like I don't know the character a bit. Okay, um, how would this character um, change a tire on the freeway uh, at rush hour in the rain? Um, would he or she, you know, just pull right over in the fast lane by the median and get out of the car and maybe take off his shirt to show off his muscles? Um, you know, doing it the daring way and so on. Or is it the kind of character who would bump along? the right-hand verge and, um, and ruin a perfectly good $200 tire uh, just to get off the freeway to safety and to a, a, um, a gas station to have somebody else change it for him? Or how would he get the change for a $1,000 bill in, in Detroit after midnight? You know, he just said something <laughs> impossible. And it's funny how often, you know, you wind up inventing a scene that goes right into the, into the, uh, the story. Um, any case, that's what I do for those two hours a day. And even if nothing comes out of it that is useful in the evolution of the screenplay, just having done that keeps your head, you know, fixes those characters and those situations in your head so that the rest of the day when you're wandering around and when you're sleeping, your unconscious mind will be somehow or other working it over. And the next night, that night, you know, you'll wake up from a dream that is a dream about the scene that tells you something about it and so on. So um, the main thing is just never, never letting it get so far away from you that you, uh, that you forget it. Well, the writing environment, you know, I, I think uh, it seems important in, in that I have my own office at, at home um, that I defend um, viciously against maids and anybody else who wants to come in and, and try to neaten things up because I know where everything is. My office is a little bit like um, the office in W.C. Fields' office, and I think it was the bank, Dick. And somebody comes into his office, and it's just it's absolutely covered. I mean, there's just great piles of things all over the place. And somebody says, my God, I said, how do you ever find anything? He says, it's very simple. He says, every two months I lay down a layer of newspaper. But <laughs> so at any rate, I, I think that that environment is terribly important. Um, then, on the other hand, um, presumed innocent. I wrote most of the uh, most of my writing. I did on an extended trip, a two-month trip that my wife and I were taking in Australia. So I was, you know, changing hotels and writing in, in airplanes and all that. So I've done both. Um, but I think that is a steady diet for serious work. The answer is, yeah, I need I need as much regularity in my life as possible. Uh, in fact, I go to the same restaurant and have the same thing for breakfast and lunch every day, so I, I, the cut down on the number of decisions I have to make. On average, 12 to 16 drafts of a, of a screenplay before it's done. Um, and, um, and before I'll show it to anybody, it's usually gone through about eight drafts. Um, the, um, uh, I need to know how it begins. And then I need to know how it ends. And then I make a, an, out, an outline of what lies in between. And then I write sequentially, scene by scene by scene. And then I discover by the time I'm several scenes in that the story has gone right off the tracks that I had it on. So I have to go back and re-outline it on, and, and along the direction that it seems to be going. And by the time I finish my first draft and so on, I've probably uh, re-outlined it maybe uh, uh, eight or nine or ten times. It depends on the story. But um, I find outlines very useful because they just give you the steps along the way. And you can always throw them away. You can always change it. If, you're feel, if you feel that you're locked to an outline, I think it would be a very mechanical process. An adaptation, you at least get, you've got some characters, and you have you know probably two or three central events that you see. You know, that was Cool Hand Luke. Uh, you know, obviously one thing we're going to use is that um, is the egg eating sequence. You know, um, but in the course of working that story out, um, I'm thinking about um, well, the, one of the themes, that, one of the things that happens in the in the book or in the story of the screenplay is that. Um, they get word that, that his, uh, his mother has died, and their response to it is to lock him into to, um, um, uh, solitary confinement. And 
which you know is so cruel and arbitrary and so on. But the the camp, um, the head of the camp, played by Strother Martin, says uh, the reason we're we're doing this is because um, um, when a man's mother dies and so on, he's apt to get a little rabbit in his blood, meaning that he might try to escape. Um, I thought that, okay, that's a very interesting moment, but I believe that in order to make the audience respond to it and have an emotional response, not just an intellectual one of saying, how cruel, that makes me angry, that, um, that they needed to know who his mother was. Well, there was no scene with the mother in the, uh, in the book. So one of, my, one of the major, con major contributions that I made to that, um, to that adaptation was to invent a scene where his mother, who's dying of cancer, comes to see him um, at the, uh, the prison camp. And you get to know um, a woman, and you see his reaction to her and what she's like. It gives you some sense um, of how he came to be the character that he is. But more, than impor but more important uh, to me than that was the fact that by now the audience has had an emotional attachment. They love that mother. She was terrific. I made her as lovable, as, you know, interesting and lovable as I could. And, um, um, and she was played by a uh, major actress and so on who got an Academy nomination for it. I can't remember her name. Not terrible. In any case, um, so the invention of that character was a deliberate manipulation on my part to engage the audience so that later on when they hear that she's died, it's not just an offstage character and so on. It's somebody that they know and that they cared about. And, uh, and so they have an emotional response to it, not just an intellectual one. Um, that was a, um, I can't remember whether that came in the course of outlining it. I think I'm pretty sure it did because I wanted to prepare for that scene. So I'm thinking, okay, what kind of a scene can I have that will set up and enrich this scene when it comes, down, comes later in the, uh, in the sequence? Um, so I probably indicated that in my outline and so on. Mom comes to call and go from there. How long does it usually take you to finish a script? Realistically, six to eight months. The whole process. You don't learn anything from your successes. Um, you learn what you learn from. It's painful. You learn from your mistakes. You know, the major, th you know, when you're talking about learning, it's still a learning process. I think that you know, making every movie is like learning how to make that movie. And once you've finished making it, you, um, you can look at it and you say, well, now I know how to, make, uh, to write the, and direct that movie. Um, but until then, you really don't know how. It's like finding out how to make that movie, um, not how to make movies. We all know how to make movies, but how to make any particular movie, we don't, don't know a damn thing about it until we start that particular movie. That's why it's so difficult. And there, why it's so few, there are so few people who do it well. Um, the other thing I was, uh, that just occurred to me about learning, the learning process, is that I think the most major change in my writing came the first time I sat down with a group of actors to rehearse a scene that I had written. Um, and I suddenly, you know, hearing it come from their mouths, what worked and what didn't work was so interesting. I never wrote quite the same way again. And it's the difference between simply writing it in, in your head and hearing those voices, you know, that in the dialogue on the page. And a little bit also it has to do with the way you envision it. As I'm writing, I'm seeing it happen up on screen. I can close my eyes and I see that scene playing out um, and the images. Do you um, have specific actors in your head as you write? Them? No, no. Even when, I've, even when I've been writing for, you know, I knew Cool and Luke, we knew it was going to be Newman. Um, uh, Citizen Cohn, I knew it was going to be uh, uh, Jimmy Woods. But, um, no, I just wanted to write the, the part of the, of the character. I try to forget the actor as much as I can. And, you know, interestingly enough, most um, actors want you to do that. Newman kept it all through the writing of uh, Cool Hand Luke. Uh, Newman kept coming to me and saying, uh, would, would stop me and say, um, are you writing this for me? And I'd have to say, no, 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 I'm writing, you know, I'm just writing Cool Hand Luke. Um, and if you don't like what's there, you know, we can discuss it. And he said, no, 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 I just want to be sure 
that you're not trying to, to carve it for me because that doesn't leave me anything to do. The important thing in beginning a, a movie is that what we are, we, we need to let the audience know in those fir first few seconds of the movie um, how we are going to spend the next two hours of our lives together. What is it going to be like? Am I going to scare the bejesus out of them and then make them whole, or am I just going to make them numb by beating them over the head with endless bloodshed? Am I going to entertain them with snappy dialogue um, and fascinating characters? Am I going to, you know, give them a tragedy that in the end will make them feel like they have moved to a new place in their lives? Or, you know, something like that. And you have to get something on the paper that represents that scene, that tells the audience what it's going to be like. Um, and lets them know also that they're in good hands, that they're not going to be abused. How do I want them to feel at this point in the, in the picture? What, what do I want them to be thinking and feeling? So what can I do? What can I have my characters do? Uh, or what can I show them that is going to be a revelation to them um, about the truth of the scene? Because there's a sense in which uh, each scene that you begin with um, the audience doesn't understand, and neither do I when I start to write, what's going to happen in that scene. And I need to surprise them and surprise them with a truth that they re already knew in their hearts, but they didn't know they knew it. And that's what the scene is about, that just as the scene comes to its end and so on, they have suddenly learned a truth that they, uh, uh, that they didn't know that they knew. Audiences and filmmakers alike um, are growing up, growing and changing together and have been very swiftly over the past uh, couple of generations. Um, and we no longer do scenes where, you know, so-and-so goes to somebody's house and so on, where you see the taxi drive up and stop and he pays the taxi man and he walks up the walk and he opens the door and one thing or other. We go right in the, the door with him, you know, and the two people who are going to have their confrontation and so on, have it right away. Um, also, I think that we have done away with the third act of scenes. That is, um, uh, husband and wife are fighting. Um, he does something absolutely unforgivable. I don't know. And um, she... Um, uh, and her reaction is to, uh, to leave the room. And we show that whole scene. Okay, that's what we used to do. Now it's a matter of he does something unforgivable and so on, and you don't even cut to the other person. You jump to the next scene. We're moving that quickly in, and so that we go from the climax of the scene to the beginning of the next, because in, in essence what a scene does when it finishes is it motivates the next scene. Somebody does something in scene A, that brings about scene B, or in scene B, somebody is doing something that is going to play back in the audience's mind on whatever was being done in the preceding scene. Um, we no longer wait around very much beyond the climax of that first scene. You would get right to the climax of it and so on, and we go bang to the next thing that is happening because of that climax. We don't show the, um, uh, the result of it in, that, in the same scene. I don't know whether I'm being clear or not, but it's a matter of moving much, much faster than we used to. I don't think that we can judge whether it's good or bad. Um, it just simply is. Um, we may, and if we don't like it, then I think there's only one choice, and that is to get out of the business. Um, and I guess it's one way to know when you become superannuated and, um, and don't belong around anymore, when you don't understand the language. As far as MTV, for example, is concerned, um, I'm out of the business. I wouldn't even try to do those things and so on because, A, I don't like it, and secondly, it, it just irritates me um, because the, arbi the arbitrary cuts and the, and the cocked angles and so on for no reason at all. It's very postmodern. It's all surface style, and it has no meaning or content, and um, that doesn't interest me. I don't like to think in terms of acts um, because um, the idea of acts comes from, from, the, uh, from the theater where you had a curtain came down and then you went out in the lobby and smoked and gossiped and had a drink and then you'd come back and there would be another little chunk of story. Um, 
and uh, and also it locks you into a kind of rigid uh, Sid Field kind of um, of thinking, and I don't believe in that. Um, but what I do believe is that there are movements, and I like to think of the movements as more more like the movements in music, the movements of a symphony, the movement movements of a of a of a, of a rondo, the movements of a of a cantata. Um, and you could have any number of movements, but basically there are three movements. One is, for me, when in every story the characters are in some sort of situation uh, where one or another of the, of the people in, in the situation, or sometimes there's something that happens without, but it's easier to talk about when the characters are motivating it themselves, that somebody does something which so changes the situation, puts them in a state of da danger or jeopardy or whatever, that they can no longer go back to where they were before. In, the, there comes a, there, in most stories, there is a period of time when everybody could just say, wait a second, let's not go on doing what we're doing. We'll just go and live on the way we were. But then somebody does something. Somebody murders somebody. Well, murder has to be, you know, uh, somebody has to be uh, arrested and tried and one thing and another and so on. From that moment of the irreversible action that somebody takes, that's the end of the first movement. The second movement is now the rules of life have changed. The characters are in, in an entirely new landscape where they don't recognize um, or whatever the landmarks are in the landscape, they are so altered by what has happened that they no longer have the same meaning. The people, are, my characters, are now having to move, um, are, are now having to discover how to live with this new situation. It's like September 11th. Everything has changed for everybody. How are we going to find our lives? So you have a bunch of characters now in the second movement of the story who are looking for, um, for the answer of how they are going to resolve the situation for themselves either to find their way back, if they possibly could, or to find and settle upon a, a solution for the problem that they are confronting. Um, you come to the end of that movement arrives when at last the hero or the heroine says, ah, something happens to them, or they have a, um, they have, uh, they've tried this, they've tried that, now they try the other thing, that reveals to them how the story must end. Then you're in the third movement, which is just simply working through, working out that. How do we get from that realization or understanding to the ending of, of the story, with, and at, at which point they are back. They are at some point or other where they can live the rest of their lives, and we know what the rest of their lives are going to be like. They're either dead or they're happy or they're unhappy or whatever it turns out to be. So I see it in terms of, of three movements rather than three acts. Who are the writers that you really admire? Who wrote things you wish you'd written or things that have really influenced you? Oh, boy. Dostoevsky. Uh, <laughs> oh, Dickens. Um, um, any of the Brontes. Um, I mean, there's so much in the 19th century, so much that is, um, that is passed by and that a younger generation of writers don't seem to even know anymore. But um, but those are the are the other print writers and so on. But then the, there's some wonderful people writing now. I mean, if you, um, there's a woman named um, um, Kinsolving Kinsolver, who is Barbara uh, uh, just such um, you know, who create. There are writers who create a world who take you into a world that takes you out of your your own world, and you begin to live with their characters as though those characters were actually your friends, family or your enemies, or what have you. And anybody who can do that is my favorite writer. And there are a great many who can do it. Um, there's no one person that I've tried to model my writing on. But you know, one thing I do do is that I try to find when I'm working on a particular project, um, I try to um, either pull out somebody I know or find somebody new and fresh and so on who's whose characters are like the characters in some fashion or other. I don't know, or, the, or there's a style of writing um, that puts my mind in the same framework as, as the characters that I'm working with. I want my characters to, to be as open, devious, problematical, and so on as this writer's people. And what I do is I will sit and, um, 
um, and maybe read a few pages of that before I get to uh, before I sit down and to actually start writing. What I was referring to when I was talking about style is finding the style for the for that particular story. Um, uh, Citizen Cone, finding you know the the fact that that some scenes are are, are hallucinatory, but they're all mixed up with you know. It, 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 um, uh, some are imaginary and some are real, and you never. Sometimes you're never quite sure which, which world you're in, the imaginary or the real, um, uh, and that becomes a kind of the musical rhythm uh, of the piece. Um, is what I'm what I'm talking about about it, finding the style for it, because once you've found that style, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to write the piece. You know what you're doing every time you sit down. Uh, it's not like it's, it's. Um, um, that you have this, you know, you always have this infinitude, infinity of choices to make unless you have some sort of uh, operating principle to guide you through. And that means knowing what the theme is. What is it about? And what is the style in which I am going to do this? If you have a good handle on that, then you're not, your mind isn't going all over in the, the whole infinity of choices that you might make um, for your characters or for what you're going to do and so on because there are only a few things that are going to fit. And, um, and until you get that, I, it would be impossible for me to, to know what to do. Each character has his, his or her own style. They should, so they differentiate. You know, it's amazing how many screen plays you read that if you put your thumb over the character's name, um, you would never know who was, was saying that. In a really good screenplay or stage play, you put your thumb over the, uh, the, or just eliminate the characters' names, and so you know who's talking because they each have their own particular rhythm. Uh, some people talk in big, long, complicated sentences with, sub um, um, with uh, sub um, subsidiary clauses, if that's the right word. Um, some people talk in short declarative sentences. Some people talk loud. Some people talk soft. Um, and whatever that is, it reflects their inner character in some fashion or other. They are um, a, a decisive, uh, strong, and uh, strong-minded person who is impatient with, with, um, with any kind of opposition and so on. I might have uh, speak in short declarative sentences, um, and very seldom ask a question. It's you know the style of speech reflects the inner character. What are the qualifications for a uh, for a writer? And that uh, and and that goes to having a story to tell. That goes to having some life experience. Um, and until you've had that, um, you know, I don't think that you're in a position to write much. It's a lot easier now talking about screenwriting because there are film schools who can and, and writing schools and so on, which were not available to us when I, when I came into the uh, end of the racket. Um, and that helps because you, you, you're out there and you're writing stuff and, and you've got somebody who's going to uh, look at it and, and, uh, and react to it. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go and do what everybody tells you. You know, to, um, don't respond to criticism that you don't believe in. You really need to find a teacher whose judgment you trust, or a teacher who whose judgment you so deeply distrust that whenever that person likes what you've done, you know it's something that you, you're sure that it's something that's wrong. <laughs> but um, joking aside. Um, the real thing is to, um, the, the old dumb stuff and so on, is it to be true to yourself, um, to write passionately from the heart, um, preferably to write from your own experience, because especially early on in life, because it's uh, uh, in your writing life, because it's just too damn difficult to make things up. Uh, and too much of what we make up um, is gleaned from our experience in the theater or in front of the box. You find yourself imitating other people. Um, the main thing is to write passionately what you believe in without regard to whether or not you think it can sell because the biggest mistake you can make is to try to, um, um, to go up against the professionals at their own game, to write a West Wing or to write a, uh, uh, a Sopranos or something like that. Um, those guys know how to write that stuff and they've been doing it for a long time. You know, you don't want to go out as to learn how to play baseball you don't want to go out and, and take batting practice with the Yankees because you'll just feel like a fool and you're going to get your shit, your ass kicked in. So 
Um, the answer is to write what you know as well as you possibly can because more people, I, I, the most people I know who have gone on to long careers in the business and good careers um, started with a screenplay that they wrote that got passed around from hand to hand by people who read it so, who said, listen, nobody's ever going to make this movie but this kid can write. And that's the way you really get, get started. People who don't read are, um, are depriving themselves of, of an enormous amount. Well, they're depriving themselves of the riches of the richest culture uh, in the history of, of mankind. Uh, we stand, believe it or not, in my opinion at least, at the peak um, of civilization and, and, and our historical records now include um, uh, riches of the imagination which it's impossible to read it all. As recently as the end of the 18th century, it was possible for a, uh, for a single person to read pretty much everything in terms of imaginative literature that had ever been written. Now it would be utterly, absolutely impossible because we have all distilled from ourselves over this period of time an enormous amount of, um, uh, of of literature that expresses so much about the human condition um, that uh, that most of it just lies unread in, in libraries. To deprive yourselves of the opportunities of imagining life, of seeing life through the minds of Tolstoy and Dickens and Dostoevsky and and, and um, uh, Shakespeare um, is an act of madness to me. I'll tell you what I think about, honestly, about teaching screenwriting, uh, which I occasionally try to do. I don't think that you can teach screenwriting, and I don't think that you can teach making a movie, but you can teach people how to think about it. And that will help them get to it, because it has to come eventually come from inside.